Lamentations was written to help the exiles process the destruction of Jerusalem, an event which ended their temple-ordered relationship with God and their sovereignty under a Davidic king. Their grief and their disorientation were inexpressible. Therefore, they needed the words to express their pain and to ask their questions. And that's what Lamentations helps them to do. And the poet of Lamentations begins in his first poem by imagining the city of Zion as a woman, a woman whose whole family has been killed, and now she is a widow left all alone. Let's take a look at the opening lines of Lamentations. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she has become. And now she's all alone. Look, Judah is gone into exile. Um, none come to the, the festival in Jerusalem. Her gates, which used to be full of people, are now desolate. Her children have gone away as captives. All of her majesty, that is her, her princes, they've departed. They fled before the pursuer. And this poor wounded widow, Zion, she's, she's actually not innocent, however. She is an adulteress. It says that among all of her lovers, there was none found to comfort her. All of her friends have become her enemies. Look at this, her, her lovers. You remember that story in, I think it's 2 Kings 19, where Hezekiah is in Jerusalem and he's surrounded by the Assyrian army. And he takes um, a letter that was written to him by the Assyrian commander and he lays that letter before Yahweh and he prays to God for deliverance. And then Isaiah says, God has heard your prayer. He will save you. And then Yahweh sends his destroying angel and he kills 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers and Hezekiah is delivered. That is what every Israelite king should have done. But instead of trusting God alone for their deliverance, they turned to other nations, to other lovers, and gave them a whole bunch of money and said, you deliver me, you save me. And that's what's meant by these lovers. So initially, um, Judah is going to uh, get in bed with, they're, they're going to um, ally with Babylon, believe it or not. But then Babylon is going to move from being a lover to becoming an enemy. And then Lady Zion is going to go back to an earlier lover, to Egypt, and say, Egypt, you save me from Babylon. And that's what's meant by these lines in, in chapter 4 where it says that our eyes failed ever watching vainly for help from a nation which could not save. It's because Egypt it is a broken reed, and, and it pierces the hand of someone who leans on it. Well, in verse 9, the poet is going to put words in the mouth of Lady Zion, and she is going to say, look, look and see, behold my affliction, she cries out. And this, this call to look, to behold, to see is going to be repeated seven times in the book of Lamentations. So fancy that. Well, she's going to first call out for Yahweh to look and see. My enemies have triumphed over me, she cries. And then she turns to whoever will, will listen to her. And she says, look, O people, Yahweh is the one who did this to me. It is his hand that is against me in, in judgment. And let's, let's see that in chapter 1, verse 12. Look and see, all you who pass by, Yahweh inflicted me on the day of his anger. He set um, a fire among me. He made it descend into my bones. He spread a net. He turned me back and left me stunned. He rejected all my mighty men. He trotted me as in a wine press. So, Lady Zion clearly acknowledges that God is the one who did this, but she also admits that I deserved it. It is my fault, for I have rebelled, she says. And she, she makes this statement in a pretty neat chiasm, starting in verse 18 of chapter 1. Let's look at that chiasm. Now, you remember what a chiasm is, don't you? How the, the outside sections match and then the inside sections and there's, there's often a center section. Well, that's the case here in 18 through 20. We see the outside section is a statement of um, a confession of rebellion. The Lord is in the right for I have rebelled against his word. And then down in 20, I have been 
rebellious. And then in one step is a call to look and to see, be, hear all you peoples and see my suffering. In one step, look, O Lord, for I am in distress. And what is in the center? I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. Well, um, Lady Zion is going to close her speech um, here in the final verses of chapter one by calling um, for God to inflict vengeance against her enemies. Uh, she says here, let them be as I am and deal with them as you have dealt with me, she cries. And actually this, this call for vengeance against enemies is going to be repeated um, at the end of several of these poems in Lamentation. We're going to see that in, in chapter 3, and then it's here with Edom in uh, chapter 4 as well. Well, let's turn our attention now to the poet's second poem here in chapter 2. And just like um, Lady Zion's uh, admission that Yahweh is the one who brought this suffering upon her, so this section, um, the opening in, in verses 1 to 9, uh, starts by saying and repeating that Yahweh is the one who brought this judgment upon Zion, brought this destruction. There are actually 23 he has statements in these opening lines. Let, let's look at that in chapter two. Look for these he has statements. I got them in yellow. Um, he has set Zion under a cloud, cast her down, swallowed her up, broke her down, cut her um, the city down. He burned it like fire, bent his bow against it, killed all who formerly were delightful in our eyes, poured out his fury like fire. He has become like an enemy. And the poet is not going to um, attempt to hide that Yahweh did this in his anger, his, his righteous anger as a covenant-making God, in his wrath, he broke it down. He cut them down in his fierce anger. He poured out his fury like fire, his fierce indignation. And um, all of it was directed against the city, the buildings, um, of course, the people as well. But in these opening lines, the focus is on the structures which are being destroyed. Look at this. The palaces, strongholds, the booth, the meeting place, altar, sanctuary, walls and palace, rampart wall, gates and bars, all broken down. Well, the rest of the poem, the rest of chapter two is going to follow an A, B, A, B pattern, where there's a, there's a discussion of destruction, then mourning, then destruction, and then mourning or, or crying out again. And in this second destruction section, the poet is going to speak. Um, the poet is going to ask a really powerful question. He's going to ask right here in green, what can I say for you, O daughter of Jerusalem, that I may comfort you? For your ruin is as vast as the sea. How can I comfort you? No one can comfort you, the poet says. And then he concludes um, with this, this interesting statement. He says that the Lord has done what he purposed. He carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. Now, the book of Lamentations is clear. Israel's suffering was great, but their judgment was just. Suffering was great, but their judgment was just. For Israel entered into a covenant with Yahweh at um, Mount Zion, or excuse me, at um, Mount Sinai. And the, the blessings of that covenant were great. They were amazing. If Israel was to um, obey the Torah, but there were curses of that covenant too. If they were to be rebellious to Yahweh, they would be disciplined by him. And that is exactly what the book of Lamentations presents. Um, all of its suffering, so much of its statements of their suffering is rooted in the, the blessings or the, the curses of the covenant in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Take a look at this. I've compiled a table for you right here. Um, judgment and lamentations as a fulfillment of the covenant curses. Uh, we already saw in an earlier lecture how um, the people of Zion longed for food, right? They searched for bread. Where is bread and wine? The children beg for food, but no one gives it to them. Well, this is in fulfillment of 
Um, Leviticus 26, 26, which says that I will break your supply of bread. And then this is, this is really awful. In Deuteronomy 28, 30, um, God says, you will betroth the wife, but another man will ravish her. And that's what we see in Lamentations 5.11. Women are raped in Zion, young women in the towns of Judah. Um, back to Deuteronomy 28, you will build a house, but you will not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not enjoy its fruit. For our inheritance, um, the poet says in Lamentations 5, will be turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. Um, the, the Lord will bring your king uh, to another nation. And look at this, her king is among the nations. The Lord's anointed, that is the king, was captured in their pits. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, 37, you will become a horror, a proverb, a byword. Look at this, um, Lamentations 2, clap, they will clap your hands at you and hiss and wag their heads. Um, I have become a laughingstock to all peoples um, in Lamentations chapter 3. Your sons and daughters will go into captivity. Uh, the sojourner will be higher than you. He will be the head. You will be the tail. Her foes have become the head. There will be a yoke on your neck. Um, they will tear down your walls. And this is, this is so bad. Um, Deuteronomy 28.53, And you shall eat the fruit of your womb in the siege because of your hunger. Um, the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. <sighs> Yahweh is, is faithful to his word. And as Lady Zion said, the Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. Now, this section is going to end. He's going to end. The poet's going to end his little um, discussion here in 13 to 19 by calling on Israel to cry out to the Lord, and then he's going to model for them um, just how they would do that, how they might cry out to Yahweh. Well, we've we've pointed out a chiasm for you already in chapter one, and in a sense, the entire book of Lamentations is one big chiasm. And some people have seen more intricate detail in that chiasm than others have. But what is what is uh, certain is that chapter three, um, the center chapter is a critically important chapter, and we are going to save that one for our final lecture. And we're going to turn our attention now to chapter four and look at a couple of chiasms in its opening verses. Now, the first one here in um, 4, 1 to 10 is going to present a contrast between life before the siege and life after the siege or, or during the siege. Um, let's, let's look at that. I'm going to jump over to chapter 4 and, and see this chiasm that the poet presents us with. So we have, um, let me zoom out here, we have this before and after, before and after, here in um, 7 to 10, and then there's a center uh, of, uh, um, section of, of the chiasm here in uh, verse 6. So let's look at these before and after sections first. The gold has grown dim. The sons of Zion, who were like gold, now they're like clay pots. Um, those who once feasted on delicacies before, now they perish in the streets. They were brought up in purple, now they embrace ash heaps. Her princes, they were whiter than snow, but now their face is as black as soot. And at the center of this initial chiasm, there is an explanatory note justifying God's judgment. Um, it says here that the chastisement of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of Sodom. And what the poet is basically saying there is that you, Jerusalem, Zion, you have become like Sodom. Now in the second chiasm in 11 to 16, um, the outside, the outer part of the chiasm is going to focus on, on the wrath of God. It's going to say that Yahweh gave full vent to his wrath in verse 11. And then in verse 16, it says that Yahweh himself scattered them. And then in the center, um, just like in uh, 1 to 10, is a description of, of sin. This was for the sin of her prophets and for the iniquity of her priests. Now, Poem 4 is going to finish with a fascinating verse um, in verse 22. But 
Just like in chapter two, which has an A, B, A, B pattern, the same is true in chapter four, A, B, A, B. A is gonna focus on the siege of Zion and B is gonna focus on the wrath of God. In this in initial section, we saw that Yahweh um, gave full vent to his wrath. And then here in 21 and 22, it's, it's gonna say that Yahweh has, has completely emptied out his wrath. He's poured out the cup. It is completely dry now. It is finished. He is done. Look at this in 422. Really important, really fascinating. Here we are. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. Gosh, isn't that interesting? It's, uh, it's kind of curious at the same time because Israel is going to be in exile in Babylon for another 70 years, but there is a recognition that, that this event, Tisha B'Av, was the moment that the covenant-making God poured out his wrath and punishment against his covenant partners who rebelled against him. And, and in a sense, um, Israel has a clean slate once again. But the same can't be said for Edom. Their punishment is yet to be inflicted um, for uh, um, being wicked to Judah in Judah's hour of need. Well, the final poem here in chapter five is one long prayer. And just like chapter one, Lady Zion's poem, which begins with a call for Yahweh to look and see, and the poet's poem here in chapter two, which says, Yahweh, look and see. So the communal prayer of the people of uh, Zion, of Jerusalem, is also going to begin here with a call for Yahweh to look and see our disgrace, they say. And then um, it's going to have a very intricate chiasm, which follows that in verses 2 through 18. Um, and the outer sections of this chiasm are going to have these, uh, <coughs> these we, our, us statements. Um, let, let's, let's look at those, those statements here in chapter five. So um, here's the outer sections. Our, our, we, our, all these, these we, us, um, first person plural uh, pronouns. And we have that here at the uh, other section here in 15 to 18. And then in the middle of the chiasm, there's a list of all these suffering individuals. Um, we have women, young women, princes, elders, young men, boys, old men, and young men. Um, and if you look at the center of these we, our, um, outer frames of, of the chiasm, um, at the center of them, there's a statement about Israel's sin. Remember, Lamentations um, recognizes that Israel's sin was great, um, but their judgment was just. It was deserved. Um, and here in verse 7, it says that our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their iniquities. And if that is kind of confusing to you and a little unsettling, it's clarified in verse 16 when it says, Woe to us, for we, we ourselves, have sinned. And now you, you may wish that in these final verses, 19 to 22 of, of the book of Lamentations, you may wish that um, the poet would, would wrap all this weeping and suffering together in a nice little bow and tell you what it all means and that it's all going to be over soon. But that's just not this book's M. Oh, instead, what we have is th this declaration, this positive declaration by the people, Yahweh, you reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. But then they ask this question. They ask, why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so many days? And they call on Yahweh. They say, restore us to yourself, O God. But then there is this final line of the whole poem. Look at this, 522. Restore us to yourself, O Lord. Renew our days as of old, unless, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. The, the whole book ends with this unresolved anguish of heart. You see, Lamentations 
wasn't so much designed to answer our questions as to ask them. And just like it's, it's good and right and proper for us to sit with Good Friday before we rush on to Resurrection Sunday, so I'm going to leave us here um, before we search for glimmers of hope in chapter 3 next. <laughs>